as they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so it is in ecology. I'd say in the last century, we have made immense strides in our understanding of ecological systems. But the questions we ask haven't really changed that much. We're still um, interested and focused largely on abundance and distribution. Those two questions often predominate. And indeed, when I was regional biologist in Labrador, I was often asked two questions by Labradorians. Where are the caribou to? And how many are there? And so we are going to need, uh, the premise of my talk today is if we're going to answer those questions, we're often going to need to be in it for the long haul. We need long-term observations. And so today I would like to take you on, well, let's see if I can get to the next slide here. I'd like to take you on a tour across the country and we'll take a look at three studies that I've been involved in. We'll take a look at the rise and fall of Newfoundland caribou. We'll take a look at the biogeography of home range size of woodland caribou. And since I promised other biota, let's take a look at some changes over the decades of Arctic flora as well. And so since I'm talking a fair bit about that animal caribou, let's start then with a little bit of natural history of this animal, very briefly then. And indeed, it's a magnificent animal. I've had the pleasure of studying caribou in four different provinces. And we know the importance of this animal to humans because, for example, this was the species that allowed for the emergence of modern humans in Europe some 30,000 years ago. Take a look at what people were eating, especially in hard times. The middens were sometimes 100% caribou. And so we've learned a lot about this animal, and in particular, the importance of space. To understand caribou is to understand how they use space and the importance of space to their biology and conservation. They are indeed one of the most mobile pedestrians on the planet. And one of the expressions of space is home range. This is the area that an animal frequents over the course usually of one year. If we take a look at this study, looking across multiple species, each one of those is a different species, it's very clear that larger animals, larger mammals have larger home ranges. But on top of that heap, in both absolute terms and relative terms is caribou. Caribou have home ranges that exceed virtually any other land mammal. They're often expressed in the hundreds, thousands, or sometimes even hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. And so this is an animal that has been shaped literally to use space, uh, space efficiently. At caribou have large hooves, a low foot loading, which allows them to float on, on snow and on soft surfaces. And they have hollow hairs, which allow them to float and uh, swim with their backs completely out of the water. They also have precocial calves. And I can assure you that a caribou calf can stand shortly after birth, can walk within a few hours, and within a few days can outrun even the fastest biologist. Not surprisingly, caribou use space and they move so very efficiently. Take a look at this graph comparing ungulate species from sheep to hippos. And you can think of the y-axis here as the expenditure to move one gram of body mass for one kilometer. Obviously larger mammals are more efficient, but below that line, lower than any other, indeed is caribou. Caribou used less than half, only 48% of the energy we would expect for a hundred kilogram animal. I like, if you take a look at, closely at this graph as well, you'll see a W next to that caribou. What species is that, do you think? W, you're going through your, <laughs> going through your memory banks, white-tailed deer, warthogs. How about wildebeest, that other great migrator, indeed a rival for caribou in the efficiency with which wildebeest can move. So let's take a look at a couple of studies on caribou. This one in particular, I was involved in um, with uh, Shane Mahoney, who was my former boss when I was in Labrador, the rise and fall of Newfoundland caribou. And indeed, one of the most fundamental questions we can ask is what determines numbers in a population? It's been called the single most important theme that we ecologists have. And so Newfoundland caribou have been remarkable in their rise and fall since we started studying them back in the 1950s. Take a look at this graph. You see the population quadrupled in between 1975 and 1996, up to some 94,000 animals 
and since then has declined by about two thirds in about one and a half decades. What is the reason for this decline in particular? I think if we're gonna understand this, we need to broaden this context, both in space and time. So let me do it in time first. Here's the same graph on a larger, on a longer time scale. And you can see the qualitative and quantitative changes that have taken place. So the first census back in the 1950s, coyotes arrived in about 1986, and they see the decline. But if we go back before that time, before we had scientific observations, there's lots of evidence to suggest that it's been a fall and rise and fall of Newfoundland caribou. That population likely declined at the beginning of the 20th century. We know that because Newfoundlanders were reporting a scarcity of caribou. Um, the Newfoundland wolf went extinct and a lot of hunting zones were closed. And so we'll talk about that as well, but it seems to me then that it's likely that this has been not just a single event, but something that's gone back through history and in prehistory. That's context in time. We can also take a look at context in space. Here's some work by Lee Vores, former student of mine, and Mark Boyce, University of Alberta, just looking at the trends in caribou across the circumpolar north. Red is ind indicative of decline, and indeed, virtually a uh, vast majority of the populations for which we know uh, their trends are declining. And so it seems to me that what we can learn from Newfoundland is likely to enhance our understanding of migratory caribou elsewhere. And if you look closely at this graph, at this map, you'll see that number one, well, that's Newfoundland. I don't think that's happenstance. Some of our pioneering work was done on that island. And so what we learned in this part of the world may be applicable elsewhere. Well, caribou are long-term, long-lived species whose dynamics unfold over decades. And so indeed, we're gonna need long-term data to answer those kinds of questions. And so here's just an example of that. This is some work by Tom Bergerud, whose name you're gonna hear several times today. He died just last year, but he was in many ways, the pioneer of our understanding of this animal. And he did those pioneering studies on the island of Newfoundland. One of the studies that he started back in 1957 was simply to take a look at the timing of migration of what we now call the Buckins herd. You see this red line here. And he simply had one of his technicians driving up and down the Lake Victoria Road, counting caribou in spring and fall. And so back in 1957, that's what they had. One datum, I guess you would call it, a peak in late November, early December. I think it's November 29th, and that's all he had. But he did continue that over several years. And so we can see similar peaks in November 21st, December 15th, November 18th as well. Well, the value of those data only increased with time. And so Shane Mahoney and I looked at the timing of migration of that herd, not just in the 1960s and 70s, or 50s, but also we updated that with some telemetry observations in the 1980s, and then again, in the early 2000s. And the trend is stark and remarkable. In the fall, these animals were migrating about one month earlier than they did back in the 1950s. And in the spring, they were migrating about one month later. In other words, they were spending about two months less per year on their summer grounds. And indeed, that's a significant relationship. I have to tell you, I presented that at a poster at a conference some years ago, and a biologist said to me, well, you would still see those trends even if you didn't have those long-term data. I disagreed, and so as soon as I got home, what did I do? Well, I repeated those tests and indeed, without the long-term observations from Bergerud, we have non-significant relationships. In other words, suggestive, but there's no apparent trend without the long-term data. Why that change of migration? Well, learning from the George River herd in Labrador, I suspected that perhaps it might have been degradation of the summer and calving grounds. And so we expected some changes in the body condition, body size of those animals as well. Here's some more long-term data, looking just at the standard uh, external measurements that we often take on caribou. And so we had some data from 1963, very small numbers, just five males, 19 females. These were animals that were translocated on the island. 
And we updated those with some data of live captured animals. In every case, we had significant declines in body size, both in shoulder height, hind foot length, total length, chest circumference of about 6%. So caribou were clearly smaller three decades later than they were in the 1960s. To that, we also added some more evidence, perhaps of decline and degradation of those calving grounds by looking at the radio locations of individual females at calving. I think there were 529 such locations. And looking at the fidelity that these animals had to the calving grounds, because that's how we identify the herds. What we used was called a fuzzy membership coefficient. It varies between zero and one. One means complete membership, zero means uh, no membership at all. So it varies between those two. And what we found was over time, those females were showing less fidelity, less membership to those calving grounds, a decline in the 1980s from 0.8 down to 0 0.7 to 7 to 4. And that's a significant decline as well. So declines in body size, less fidelity, less likelihood to return to the calving grounds. Finally, we also looked at the timing of migration again and updated that. And coincident with the peak in numbers of that population, we saw a reversal of that trend. That's also a significant change. And so once the population peaked, the animals started returning to a shorter spring migration, earlier spring migration, rather about two weeks, and a later fall migration. Perhaps suggestive of some recovery of that, uh, those calving grounds. What I'm suggesting here then is perhaps food limitation. Well, suggestive, but we need something a little bit more perhaps um, definitive than that. So Shane and I also dug out more data to see if we could find over the long term some evidence of changes in habitat selection and diet. And so again, we had a very large sample size going back to the 1980s, 520 radio collared animals. And what we did was just take a look at their habitat selection. So looking at a radius, of land cover around each of those radio locations. And a really simple measure of habitat selection is something called the forage ratio. It's simply use divided by availability. Looking at that, we also looked at a finer scale, looking at 2,500 or so fecal groups that had been analyzed microhistologically, if I can say that. That's just a fancy word for looking at the fragments in the feces that are indicative of what these animals are eating. And then finally, we also had long-term data on tooth wear. More than, oh, it was some 8,324 jawbones. Each of them had been aged two ways, using the true age, or what I call it, using the annuli and the cementum, and then also looking at their apparent age based on patterns of eruption and wear. Let's take a look at those three topics right now. So what we found with regard to habitat selection is indeed those females had shifted to more open land cover. Here are three graphs, here, four graphs rather, one for each season, comparing the 1980s and 90s to the 2000s. Any data above the zero line, in other words, in the blue shows preference, something that's used disproportionately more than is available. Anything below that zero line in the pink is avoidance, used less than uh, available. What we notice is that indeed, if you take a look at open coniferous forest, for example, what was used in proportion to its availability in the 80s and 90s was then used or avoided in the 2000s. We didn't have good data on this, but we think that those open coniferous forests were some of the better areas of good forage. On the other hand, we had increased use of shrublands, barrens, and water. For example, if you take a look at the barrens, they were generally avoided across all seasons in the 1980s and 90s. And they became either used as uh, available or actually preferred in three seasons in the later years. So a distinct shift in the habitats that these animals are using across decades. The diet is perhaps even more telling. Take a look at the Middle Ridge herd, which is the best study of these herds, other herds as well. This is the percentage of different plant groups in spring, summer, and winter. And what we see is quite distinctive, irrespective of season, an increase in mosses. Mosses are very poor forage for caribou. They're low digestibility. So that increase in moss came at expense 
of higher quality foods, deciduous shrubs in spring and summer, and ericoids or evergreen shrubs as they're called, graminoids, grasses and sedges, and lichens during winter. So a poorer diet across decades at the same time. Finally, if we take a look at tooth wear, it was clear to us that the teeth are wearing fast. And I didn't have anything to do with collecting these data, but this is one of the best graphs or the most intriguing graphs I think I've ever made. And so, as I said, for each jawbone, it, two things were done with regard to age. One was to es estimate its age based on eruption and wear patterns. And the second was to determine its true age by removing a tooth, sectioning it, and counting the number of rings on the cement of the teeth. Take a look at the 1970s, the 80s, and 1990s. Here are animals that look to be four to six years old. And indeed, they were four to six years old. There's the true age of those animals there. However, when we get to the 2000s, after this population had peaked, we have a much different scenario. Animals that looked that they were four to six years old were actually on average only 3.3 years old. In other words, these animals looked older than they really were, kind of like your presenter today. <laughs> Why is that? Well, we think it, teeth were wearing faster because that's the basis of the apparent age and likely because caribou were either trying to um, glean the last bit of lichen, for example, from rocks or uh, to the soil surface, or perhaps even rougher forages that were higher in silica. And so they're teeth were wearing faster as a result of that, likely because of a poor diet. Those are the four to six year olds. Let me show you a table that's not a table, it's a figure. There's the data I just showed you for males and females. What I want you to see is that that applied to virtually all age sex classes, both males and females, the two year olds, the three year olds, the four to six, the seven to nine, and even older. And so this was across all sexes, both sexes across all age classes that the teeth of these animals was wearing faster, likely, or at least consistent with the idea of a poorer diet. Oh, let me just say that I wish I could end that talk, right, that portion of my talk right there, that it is food limitation and then that's it. But let's just say ecology is rarely so obliging. This story is more complex than that. And here's the evidence that suggests indeed it's more complex. Here's some work by Shane Mahoney looking at uh, the survival of neonates going back to the 1970s. And every year, virtually every year during those years, about 30 or so calves were radio collared shortly after birth. And then their fate was uh, tracked at least for six months. And what we see is a dramatic change up to 1997, for example, um, we had animals that had survivorship more than 40% to six years six months of age, that's indicative of a population on the increase. What you see after 2003 is a dramatic decline in that population, some rebound, but this is indicative certainly of a population in decline. And some of you may be wondering about this uh, gap in the data for four years in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Let me just tell you that was mm, a conversation that we might have over beer at a pub sometime in the future. <laughs> so what was causing that higher mortality rate? Well, predation. Take a look at these uh, data here. The top graph is the cause of mortality. And by and large, through the years, regardless of year, predation was the largest source of mortality. And of the predators, it was black bears, and more recently, coyotes as well, that were leading to that higher rate of predation on calves. So a more complex story, perhaps a food limited population, but also one where the juveniles in particular were more subject to predation mortality. What's the takeaway from this? A little harder to gauge, but I tend to think it has to do with perhaps risk prone foraging by those females. That is, when they were nutritionally stressed, those females needed to forage in riskier habitats particularly because they, they need to sustain those energetic demands of lactation. 
we have some evidence that's consistent with that as well, because this also has some management implications. Take a look at the proximity of female caribou. Again, this is based across decades to power lines. And we know that caribou tend to avoid those kinds of anthropogenic features. They seem to treat them like uh, risky areas, risky in the sense of being uh, higher in predators. What we notice across the 1980s, the 1990s and the 2000s is a change in that avoidance, is that by the 2000s, once that population had peaked, we saw a decreased avoidance, in fact, no avoidance of those power lines only during that decade. Secondly, we can look at where caribou were being harvested. This is some work by Jordan McNamara, who just finished her master's thesis. Again, we see the same pattern, is that during the 1980s, there was less likely to be, caribou were less likely to be harvested in next to or close to cut blocks. On the other hand, 1990s and the 2000s, we see a shift such that caribou perhaps are simply closer to those anthropogenic features. So this has management implications, obviously, in a nutritionally stressed population, we may find animals in areas that they would otherwise avoid. So what determines numbers of migratory caribou? I think the story that's emerging from Newfoundland goes something like this. If I can show, show this graphically, is that caribou abundance, the rise in caribou abundance has two effects. There's a decline in high quality foods, there's increases in predators. This then leads to more risk sensitive foraging by females under nutritional stress and higher rates of predation, particularly on calves, which then regulate the population. This is an evolving story though, but I think at this point we may have a better grip then on the, what regulates migratory caribou populations in Newfoundland and elsewhere. Well, I promised you more than just caribou at this talk. So let's talk a little bit about flora of the Arctic and its relationship to snow cover. This is something that Cho just mentioned uh, that I'm working on. And indeed the results I'm gonna show you here, I've not shown to anyone. So this is a world premiere with regard to that. And indeed, when we talk about snow, it is, I think, arguably the most single most important feature of the North. As my master supervisor said, Bill Pruitt, he said, if we're studying boreal ecology, the ecology of North, it is by and large the study of the ecology of snow because of the multifaceted and all pervasive effects of snow. Of course, one of the concerns we have about the Arctic is it's disproportionately warming at at least three or four times the global rate. And so one of the effects, of course, could be changes in snow cover and changes in the flora as well. And so some of the anticipated changes under climate warming are shrubification. Here's a new word I think that's likely to <laughs> become more common in the coming decades. Shrubification simply means the proliferation, especially of erect shrubs, as they become uh, more common and shift their ranges northward. At the same time, we could expect alteration of the snow regime. If snow is the single most important ecological factor, anything that changes the timing, the hardness, or the thickness of snow cover could be of great importance to northern biota. Finally, we can also imagine that those two may act in concert. In other words, the snow catching ability of shrubs could lead to more snow cover in a local sense, which may lead to more proliferation of the, of the shrubs as well. And indeed, there's a very close relationship between the flora and nival environments. Here's some work I did on Victoria Island some decades ago, just look, taking a look at that. This is called canonical correspondence analysis. And what you see here are arrows that are features of snow, the mean hardness, the thickness, the basal hardness, vertical hardness, Pukak, is the basal layer of snow, whether it was present or not. And each of those points there is a vegetation species. Certain species do well. Think, think of them as snow lovers. One of those is erect shrubs like Salix richardsoni. Anything in the Northwest quadrant, I could say, is in that, in that category. And so where there's more snow, you generally find more of these erect shrubs. On the other hand, we have species that show the opposite, Saxifragia opposite folia is one of those, the uh, um, purple saxifrage 
it tends to be in very low, shallow snow environments as well. The question then is, over the last past few decades, is have these relationships changed? Well, that sounds like a question for long-term observations. And it just so happens, well, I have some long-term observations because in the early 1990s, I studied flora and nival environments in Victoria Island because I was interested in those animals, musk oxen. And so if you're going to study a herbivore in the winter, you need to understand what they're eating, the vegetation, and you need to understand snow, which is their ma major uh, determinant of where they select habitats as well. And so I have data from 1991 to 1993. I set up 80 permanent plots, each one square meter. In each plot, I measured the percent cover of plants, the percent cover of lichens. I measured the depth of soil, and I measured snow cover over two winters as well. And I marked them with aluminum stakes. And so I still have those data. There's my notebook there. And I have some great memories as well. Take a look at those young bucks. <laughs> That's Scott Stevens. He was my assistant for uh, several weeks out on the land. And I, he's now the regional biologist in Red Deer, Alberta. And by the way, I don't know if you've been to the Arctic, but one of the challenges for any field biologist is simply travel. And so I can tell you that we walked, we flew, we tobogganed, we drove, we skidded. And when we got stuck, I was reminded of the old British general. He said he never retreated. He simply advanced in another direction. Notice as well, I'm the photographer there. I'm letting my two assistants, Corey and Mark, do the heavy lifting. And so I wanted to answer this question about altered snow regime, altered floral uh, environment. So I went back to Wellington Bay in 2019. And then after a delay due to the pandemic, and many of you are going to write that into your thesis. I went back as well. And so we went back there to do those repeat measurements to do exactly the same protocol that I had done in the 1990s. And so there's Josh and Marcus, my two assistants that were there last year. And let me tell you, to do that was, how should I say, a logistical challenge because we laid out these transects along two straight lines, one the north, one the south. And we did that without GPS. So that was simply done with a map and 100 meter tape. And so before we could do those repeat measurements, we had to find those stakes. And so if you take a look down the bottom right there, you'll see that's what I had in my notebooks. It was a photocopy of a one to 50,000 map. And if you look carefully at it, you'll see snow transect line. That's that. And so that's what we had to do. This was a challenge of of mapping, memory, and a metal detector. So looking for 80 stakes, I can happily tell you that we found 78 of those 80. So that's a 98% success rate. Not bad, I think. And so we were able then to repeat exactly the same measurements that I had done back in 1991, 92. And I was so happy to make this graph. This is with GPS now and GIS, showing where those transects were laid out with a map and 100 meter tape. Not bad, I think. A little bit bowed on the north side, but not too bad. And so we simply went back there and I repeated what I did 30 years ago. And so for each plot, we lay, each stake, we laid a one square meter plot. In each plot, we estimated the percent cover of vegetation. We also measured soil to down to rock or permafrost at the same time, just as I did back in the 90s. And so I just started analyzing these data last week. And so I set the sample unit as each of those plots. We did pair, I did a paired comparison across decades, 1991, 92 versus the more recent data. And since they didn't conform to a nice uh, normal distribution, I used a non-parametric Wilcoxon sign ranks test on both the soil depth and the percent cover of vegetation species. And since I thought of joint absences, that is where a species was absent in both periods, as uninformative, I simply left that out in each case. And so the data are pretty easy to uh, depict. I simply made graphs like this. You can look at the attribute in 1991, 92 along the x-axis, the attribute in more recently in 2019, 2022. And the red line here is 
that of the quality. So x equals y, no change. And so in other words, if in case of soil here, if most of the points lie above that line, that would suggest that soil depth is greater than it now than it was three decades ago. If most points are below that line, we have the opposite. Soil is less than three decades ago. Well, let me show you these data. And again, this is world premiere. No one's seen these yet. And so I did find indeed that a difference of about eight centimeters on average for soil depth. This is so-called active soil layer, the layer above the permafrost that has not frozen late summer. And I say the active soil layer is likely increased in thickness because I also measured down to rock as well. And so there's no, there's no differentiation between those two. I think most of those points in the lower left corner are probably simply random variation where I hit rock or not. Nonetheless, it's consistent with expectation that as the climate is warm, the permafrost occurs lower in the soil profile. That's to be expected. I also find th some things that I didn't expect. So here's erect shrub, Silex richardsoni. No significant change in abundance. There's some areas where that were devoid of willow that now have them. There's some areas that had willow that are now devoid of them, but there's no significant change, even though I expected that. On the other hand, I did find some changes that were quite prominent. One is this species here called mountain avens or Dryas integrifolia. I saw vast areas that had apparently where this species had died. And you see these gray areas here, this central photograph, for example, that's a clump of Dryas with some willow that's still there, but the Dryas has disappeared. And sometimes in ecology, what you see your field observations actually come through in your data as well. And so looking at those data, a dramatic decline for Dryas integrifolia, in absolute terms, it's declined by about 8% cover or about one third of its abundance has, declined, has disappeared. This could be due to the de decline in the permafrost, which essentially sets the water table. Dryas, I'm told, has a very short root system. And so these areas may simply have dried out. On the other hand, we found a dramatic increase in grasses and sedges, like Carex aquabilis, for example, which is a major forage for, for musk oxen, an increase in absolute terms of 4%, or about a 20% increase. Not consist, not everywhere, but something that is measurable as well. And just for fun, I said, well, what if I didn't have those paired plots? What if I didn't have this longitudinal study? And so here are here's the difference between uh, graminoid cover between those two periods. And instead of a pair test, if you simply did a man Whitney U test an independent, uh, for independent groups, suggestive, yes, but no significant difference. In other words, the spatial variation in the flora overwhelms the temporal change. I, if I had done a survey in the same area without the pair plots, I would not have been able to detect that change. I'm still working on those data. But we also did photograph them as well. So it's something I didn't do in 1991, 92, but I did now because I'm hoping and that this kind of monitoring will continue into the future. And so these are photos that only a biologist could love. Next steps though, I'll be taking Josh, my honor student back up there. We're going to do the second part of this analysis to take a look at snow cover at peak abundance and see if that relationship between the flora and novel environments have changed and see the extent to which the, there's temporal uh, consistency in the way that the snow is distributed across the landscape. So you'll have to wait for those data and that, those results to come through. Okay, one last study here that I'd like to share with you. It's a big scale study, mainly in space, but also in time. This has to do with a home range of woodland caribou across Canada. And again, home range, as John Kai and his colleagues said, it's a concept perhaps as old as ecology itself. And so this is something that is, of course, fundamental to caribou because as I showed you earlier, they have the largest home ranges or at least amongst the largest home ranges of any pedestrian on the planet. What I didn't show you is this, is that if we take a look across woodland caribou, those species, that species that inhabits the boreal forest year round, there is remarkable variation within the species. 
take a look at these 24 populations here with estimates of home range size. So I, um, we amalgamated data from across the country. There's a 30 fold difference in the average home range size between one population, the smallest to the largest. And I was looking for an analogy here. This is the best I could come up with. <laughs> is that if we take a look at that, try to express it, it's analogous to the cross-sectional area of a dime and the cross-sectional area of a softball. So a 30-fold difference within the population, within this same species. That variation has never been explained. And so we tried to tackle this in a biogeographic sense by assembling putative predictors, 18 of them in particular, to try to explain this variation. Some had to do with land cover, some with the diversity amongst patches, some with topography, snow cover, and landscape disturbance as well. And so this is a biogeographic study, a mensurative study, if you like to call it that, no um, manipulations. And so we do have to take care in these kinds of studies about correlations amongst variables. So we expected that. One way to depict that is look at the principal components analysis, as it's called, and look at the eigenvectors for the major gradients. And so from those, we chose five variables that would represent these major gradients. We picked one vegetation variable, sparse coniferous cover. We also chose both human disturbance and snow depth because of their known relationships to woodland caribou. And then finally, we also uh, looked at the extent of fire in each of these populations and the Shannon diversity index, the degree to which there's interspersion of the different types, which may allow for a population or a species to have a smaller home range. Well, let's get right to the results. We built models then and ranked them in competing sense. And what did we find? Well, human disturbance was in all top seven. Human disturbance, human disturbance, human disturbance, seven times over. In all the top models, human disturbance was the major and best predictor of the home range size of this animal. You can look at this graphically and if we do that, we see that indeed, if you take a look at human disturbance here as, and home range size on a logarithmic scale, a fairly strong relationship. And indeed, for areas, populations that had less than 10% of their population range disturbed, home ranges were inevitably more than 1,400 square kilometers. On the other hand, for disturb, areas that were disturbed, uh, had high disturbance, more than 55%, home ranges were never more than 1,500 square kilometers. You have to take care though in these kinds of studies because snow cover also had a positive relationship with home range size. That's counterintuitive because we'd expect with more snow cover, animals might restrict their home ranges. This was not as competitive in those models as was human disturbance. And indeed our take on it was that this was simply a coincidence of the negative relationship between human disturbance and snow. Finally, we can also take a look at this mapped across the species range. And here it is here. So these circles then are uh, relative to the home range size and the colors here are relative to the amount of human disturbance. What you can see is higher degrees, uh, higher disturbance along what I call the extirpation front. Woodland caribou are a threatened species. They have declined from or been extirpated from about 40% of their range. And what you see, if you look closely, is indeed smaller home ranges in those areas along the extirpation front. So where we have high human disturbance, caribou seem to shrink their home ranges and as a response to that. And this is consistent with what we know that about the demography of this animal is that where we have disturbance, uh, where disturbance is higher, recruitment, the, um, which is indicative of population growth is lower. This is some work by Cheryl Johnson and her colleagues looking across these populations and more. Fire disturbance has an effect on that, but the major driver indeed is human disturbance. Lower recruitment, lower population growth, where we have high disturbance. Finally, we also looked at other studies. Um, this is some work by Martin Hugues Saint Laurent at University of Quebec. And he found that indeed, smaller individual ranges, we were working at a population level, he found the same thing at an individual level above a threshold. So it seems to be that caribou restrict their space use, restrict their home ranges in the midst of high human disturbances.
No conclusions then? Yes. If we take a look across the boreal forest, females seem to constrict those home ranges when they're in the midst of anthropogenic disturbances, and this may reduce their encounters with predators. They treat those areas as high predation risk, and indeed wolves, for example, tend to frequent linear disturbances, for example. And so we also think we could turn this around. In other words, if we're looking for areas that have high uh, habitat loss due to humans, smaller home ranges might be indicative of that. It also underscores that if we're looking for one feature that's most important in all for caribou, it's space. The way they use space is inherent in their biology. And I love this quote, here's Tom Bergerud and colleagues again, space, it's the major environmental variable that allows caribou to coexist with their predators. So in praise of the longer term, yes, we need to be in this for the long haul. And I like good quotes. I like this one in particular. If we're going to look at emerging problems, they're more easily dealt with when the basic research has already in, been done. In recent years, our ability to respond to problems such as mountain pine beetle or SARS has depended on pre-existing research programs. That's an anonymous quote from a, from a uh, review of NSERT Discovery Grant Program. I'd like to know who that is. So if that's you, please contact me because we need to be anticipatory as well. Finally, I like this, work by, uh, this quote by Linda Meyer. He says, what do we need to do? Well, if we're going to recognize change and understand change, we need to be in for the long haul, long-term investment. Now, my supervisor, Bill Pruitt, told me, always end a talk with a sunset shot. And so I've done that here. And look at that. I was able to get the beast in it as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>